Ladies and gentlemen, now that we're all settled in, I'd like to talk about the academic process today. We'll take a very brief look at its history and then consider its practice, because that's why we're here. He, uh, we have a passionate desire to follow in the footsteps of the old masters, to learn their principles and techniques and go beyond them to find our own voice and communicate our own ideas in this beautiful and rich tradition of realist painting. In the medieval times and in the Renaissance, students learned to paint through the apprenticeship system. They apprenticed themselves to establish master for a period of years. Here, you see a fairly early etching of a typical studio situation. Here's the master working on a painting, and over here we see some assistants grinding paint on these stone blocks and various paintings that are still in process of being produced are leaning against the wall here. After your seven-year apprenticeship, you went into what was called your journeymanship, which is when you could, then, take your own commissions, except that they had to be endorsed by the master. You had to have the master's consent and even his presence while dealing with the clients, because the master would then sign a contract guaranteeing the success of the work. The painting was then done in the master's studio, as here, with the lady sitting for her portrait and a chaperone present. Also, more often than not, the journeyman, along with the more advanced apprentices, would assist the master in painting his works. The signature doesn't mean that the master painted the painting alone, rather that he approved it as a finished work from the studio. His signature confirmed his endorsement. This was the old way of learning. Later, in the Renaissance, in the mid-1500s, here in Florence, an academy was founded. The original academy was here, near the church of San Michele, and there's still a sign on the wall saying, L'Accademia del Disegno. The president was Michelangelo. However, it wasn't an academy in the sense that we think of as an academy. It was more of a club where painters could go to discuss high ideals, philosophical and artistic ideas. But what happened eventually was that the painters started to bring their favorite students and set these young people to taking notes and drawing from class to casts. Though it was very unstructured, this was the beginning of an art academy as we understand the word today. As time went on, the market changed, particularly in the north where there wasn't such a demand for large-scale murals. This led to a breakdown of the older apprenticeship system as it wasn't economically feasible to maintain such a large studio. There'd be nothing for all those apprentices to do. While painters were still willing to accept personal students, it would be in a much smaller setting. Here is an etching of Rembrandt with his pupils. The master is correcting a drawing or possibly giving a demonstration. On the side, the model is in pose, reclining. Above her are the plaster casts, which we use then as now, to study how light and shade is used to represent a three-dimensional form. And over here is the mannequin, which could be dressed up in the clothes that the client would like to be seen wearing in his or her portrait, so that the drapery folds didn't change whenever the model wanted to take a break and move. This private studio situation continued throughout the centuries, and even today, but in very isolated circumstances today. However, in the mid 1600s, the King of France started an academy, an art school, where a large number of students could learn their craft from professional artists and teachers. In France, in the 19th century, there developed an interesting but complicated scenario in which there were a bunch of studios called ateliers, meaning studios, as well as a big official art school called the École des Beaux-Arts. There were equivalents all over Europe. Very often, students would study drawing at the école, but go to the individual atelier to learn how to paint. Here, we see the kind of work that was done in the atelier. Here's another example of an academic drawing, this time an Italian one. One of the most important things when drawing, whether you're drawing with graphite, charcoal, or oil paint, is to keep your rendering within specific value families. This is the light family, and this is the shadow family. And never should your lightest dark be as light as your darkest light. You must keep the value of families separate. Remember Romeo and Juliet, the Capulets and the Montagues. When the two families mixed, chaos ensued. 
You can see that the majority of descriptive values are reserved for the light. And to enable that kind of range, the shadows must be simplified and kept very dark. But not so dark as to lose any variety within them, not to the extent that they are absolutely black. Here's another great example of drawing from the 19th century, this time from Anna Klumka, who, just a gossipy aside, was Rosa Bonheur's lover and lifetime companion.